Thanks for joining us for New Mexico in Focus. We're revisiting interviews this week from past shows. Now, Stefan Pastis. He worked for years as a lawyer while submitting comic strips for what would become the syndicated comic Pearls Before Swine. Characters such as rat, pig, goat, zebra, and some very stupid crocodiles present an often controversial and hilarious view of the world. That includes merciless parodies of older comic strips, profanity, alcohol, and painfully bad puns. Megan Kermick sat down with him last year when his daily comic strip just happened to be riffing on a very popular TV show set right here in Albuquerque. Stefan Pastis, thank you for joining us on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you for, for having me. For your book tour. Yes. Pearls Falling Fast. It's your 24th. 24th Pearls book. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Yeah. Uh, despite that, I want to ask you about, as we tape this, your strip today that ran in the Albuquerque Journal features Rat <laughs> breaking bad. <laughs> yes. Complete with hazmat suit. And he and Pig are looking for a slimy, unethical Saul Goodman type <laughs> lawyer to help them. And you are in the strip and you raise your hand. <laughs> yes, they found me because I was a lawyer for 10 years. I don't know if people know that you were actually a lawyer, so why did you pursue a law career? Uh, you know, I think it was for all the wrong reasons. It was really because I knew lawyers made a lot of money. So I took the traditional route and got a law degree. And then within the first year of being a lawyer, I knew that I did not like it and I didn't want to do it. So it was really a mistake. When you go into something for just money like that, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> but you were drawing all the time. I was always drawing like at nights and on weekends. And so the hope was that I would get syndicated. My comic strip would get picked up to go into newspapers. And then I could quit being a lawyer. So I would always submit these strips. Um, and they would always get rejected for years. It took a long time. What was it like trying to break in? It was so depressing because you would write something and you think it was really good. And you would turn it in and you would get all form rejection letters. And it's hard to keep, it's hard to justify that time commitment. Um, and so, but I got one editor who wrote me um, a handwritten rejection. And that, that little <laughs> handwritten rejection is like the little string I hung on really? to. Yeah, so that kept me going. And then um, after about five years of it, um, they liked the Pearl Strip. And that's when it took off. And you got it, they posted it online, right? And the, the yeah, they did this really weird experiment. Um, they were supposed to launch me in newspapers. Mm -hmm. And then the salesman for the syndicate came forward and they said, there's no way. This won't sell. Um, Why? It, it has no demographic. Yeah, they're stick figures. They talk about death. Nothing seems to happen. <laughs> so, um, so they said, we're not going to put it in papers. Uh, we're just going to put it online and see what happens. So they put it online, and it did OK, but it didn't do great. And then Scott Adams, the creator at Dilbert, turned out he was reading it online. And he told all of his readers to go read it. And so the hits, they, which I was watching, mm -hmm. went from like a 2,000 hit day on a Tuesday to 155,000 hit on a Wednesday, because that was Scott's following. They all wow. came to read it. And so I held that audience, and then they said, OK, he can be in newspapers. So I owe my whole career to, the, to Scott Adams. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you also, you approached Charles Schultz. You both had lived in Santa Rosa when he was at a cafe. Yeah. He actually sat and talked with you about your work. He totally. An and first off, I had the worst opening line ever because uh, I walked up to him when he was at his table and I said, Hi, Mr. Schultz. My name is Stefan Pastis and I'm an attorney. So he thought he was getting served with a subpoena. So his face just went white. <laughs> so that was <laughs> terrible. But then I said, I also draw. And the minute I said that, he cleared off the seat next to him and he said, Come sit down. So he talked to me for an hour. And I was a total nobody. I wasn't, I wasn't syndicated yet. He was great. Yeah. Is that kind of camaraderie typical among yeah. comic strip artists? Yeah, and it shouldn't be because it shouldn't um, be. <laughs> it's a, it's a zero-sum game. And you know, most people probably don't know this. But if I go into a newspaper comic section, if Pearls goes in, something goes out. Mm -hmm. There's only so many newspaper slots. So I only win at somebody's expense. And yet, the 200 of us in the United States who are syndicated cartoonists are friends. Um, we have more in common than that. Where, you know, it's such an odd job where you sit at home by yourself and you do this little thing that goes out there. Um, it's very strange. And so that common part kind of um, outweighs the competitive part. 
So, yeah. Now, that said, you often make fun of other comics. Yes. And curls. I, I will say one strip in your book <laughs> has Billy from Family Circus invading the strip, beating up the other characters, swearing at them <laughs> yeah. in revenge for yeah. all the fun that you've made of a family circus. So yeah. what was Bill Keen's reaction <laughs> to this? He was so great. So the most offensive ones I did were when they, the family and Family Circus harbored um, Osama bin Laden for a week because they were so out of <laughs> touch they had no idea who he was so they all ended up going to Guantanamo Bay and they were imprisoned and so Bill Keen the mm -hmm. original creator liked it so much that he asked me for and the original of the most offensive one and when I went and visited him at his house in Arizona he had that hanging and framed in his studio so he had a great sense of humor so when people write to me and they go how can you do that to the poor family circus this mm -hmm. is outrageous I always want to say we're friends they think it's funny you know it's great so they don't mind what do you think your biggest influences are in terms of other comics that you were well, growing up? Well, for me and every cartoonist you see on the comics page, it all comes down to one man. We are all influenced by Schultz. Schultz is the, the root of the tree that we all come from. You, you won't find a cartoonist on the comics page who does not say he was not influenced by Schultz. Everybody was influenced by Schultz. Really? He's the beginning and the end for all of us. He changed all of cartooning, for sure. What about others? Yeah, well, so when I it was sort of a teenager, it was what we called the big three, uh, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, Bloom County, and The Far Side. And then most directly, literally, I learned how to write a three-panel strip from reading Dilbert, which may be why I ended up uh, liking it. <laughs> I was more or less mimicking him. I, I just went through all his books, and I learned how to do it. Because a three-panel strip is different than a four-panel. You, mm -hmm. you have no time to waste. You have to set the whole premise in one panel, because that's it. Are all the... Uh the uh, different animal characters, different parts of you? Yeah, and that also came from Schultz. I asked him that question when oh, I met really? him. I okay. Yeah, I said, where are, are they all different people? And he said, never base a character on someone else because the only person you truly know is yourself. So if you don't base the characters on you, you won't know them fully enough to have a well-rounded, believable character. So the result is, Rat is definitely me, as sociopathic as he is. Uh, but Pig is also me, and Goat is me. Um, the Crocs, to some extent, I'll walk around the house with my kids and talk to them like the Crocs, <laughs> which, which they think is horrible and annoying. Guard um, duck. And the d guard duck, yeah. I mean, they're all aspects, yeah. Now, you said that, um, I've read interviews, you said Rat is most like you, which seems, you seem like a nice guy, Stefan, and Rat <laughs> you know is nasty is? and cynical. Here's what it is. When you drive on the freeway and somebody does something mean to you, you know that voice in your head that says you want to do A, B, and C, but you don't? Rat is the one who does that. So, so he, Rat is your id. Yeah, I think, and I think he's everybody's id, you know? That's the fun part about comic strips. You can, you can have that uh, release valve. That's why I think it's so nuts when people uh, complain about comics. I mean, that's the one area where we should be able to sort of run free and not tamp that down. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, um, like a, a pressure valve, you know, releasing that anger, whatever it ha you have, in the form of humor. Now, in one storyline in this book, Rat um, occupies Sesame Street. <laughs> rather yeah. than Wall Street, and yeah, he tells right. Grover to shut his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and then to uh, get him off uh, Sesame Street, PBS lets him host Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which he then oh, proceeds yeah. to that drink a beer on air, and then jihadist take over King Friday's castle and make Rat wear a burqa. Have you no shame, sir? And that last one, yeah. <laughs> that last one got me into a lot of trouble. That jihadist really? thing was a big deal. Yeah, there were... Um, for the depiction of Muslims, I got in trouble. For the depiction of how they treat women, I got in trouble. For doing what it did to Mr. Rogers, I got in trouble. That one came from four different angles. Um, so, But it was so funny to me to just do something, I don't know, like that to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. What are your favorite targets? Targets. Um, I like making fun of all of the old comics. To me, that's just really funny. And anybody who's sort of, um, I don't know, pompous, like it's such an easy target. They sort of walk out on a ledge, and it's so easy to saw it off. Um, anybody who's self-important is a great target. It's sort of like my job. That's what a cartoonist is supposed to do. You know? And it's so unfair, too, because they really can't fight back. You know? Like, if I make fun of somebody in a comic strip, and they get really mad, mm -hmm. what can they do? If they, get really, if they get really angry, it's just a comic strip. You know what I mean? It almost, it's almost like they look silly getting really angry. So 
Um, and I have the final say, because if they make me mad in their response, I can just do it again the next day. Do you feel like so, you're getting away with stuff every, whenever totally. you see these show up in print? You're like the class clown that the teacher can't control. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I just get to pass these notes to people, and I don't get in trouble. Instead of getting in trouble, people pay me to do it. I mean, and I don't have to have a real job. How great is that <laughs> for work if you can get it? Now, people who read this know that you put yourself in the strip a lot, as yes. with the Breaking Bad strip. And one of the running gags is an elaborate setup to a very bad pun. <laughs> yeah. And then the characters take revenge on you. They beat you up, torch yeah. your desk, put you in cement shoes, and throw you in the ocean. You even had rat kicking you in the groin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is this how you keep yourself humbled and grounded? Totally. And let me say something on that last point. It was supposed to be a taboo in the comics to have somebody kicked in the groin. So that was, uh, I was breaking barriers with that one. Mm -hmm. I was so proud of that. And Scott Adams wrote to me and said, I can't believe you had that in your strip. Way to go. <laughs> like, <that laughs> so was, you broke the barrier. Yeah. I, I was really proud of that. I know, I know I probably shouldn't be, but yeah, that was funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> So what's next for you? You have a couple of kids' books. One of them, they feature Timmy, yes. who's a failure at everything. Yes. It's like the anti-encyclopedia brown. Exactly. Book. Yeah, it's a kid named Timmy Failure. It's a book that came out a year ago, and then the sequel came out two weeks ago. And um, it's a middle grade book, like mm -hmm. an illustrated novel, sort of like a Diary of a Wimpy Kid. So Timmy thinks he's a brilliant detective, but he's really not smart uh, at all. <laughs> and he's got <laughs> this a uh, is not like he's got, children's he's got <laughs> I know, he's got a, a polar bear sidekick. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's really fun. And people say like, how do you write the kids books? And I really I did nothing different than I do in the strip, except they said, um, you can't have cigarettes, <laughs> uh, you can't have beer, and nobody can swear. So with those three limitations, I wrote the book. Yeah. So that knocks out anything you're doing in pearls. Yeah, that was 70% of my humor, okay. but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I'm curious, if we, if we have to wrap up, unfortunately, but newspapers are struggling. So what does yeah. that mean for comics like yourself? You know, we never knew what that meant, like about four or five years ago. Like if something happened in newspapers, would that be it for comic strips? Mm -hmm. um, we still don't fully know, but we have learned one thing that with social media, mm -hmm. the need for comic strips is as great as it's ever been. It serves this function to get in and out quickly and laugh. And people always want to share things like that. So when you post one of those things on Facebook or any social media, it gets spread like crazy. But how do you guys get paid then? That's the key question. Yeah, so for <laughs> me, I mean, the books are, you know, always a good thing. And so, but the newspapers are still, you know, the bulk of our earnings. So. Um, if something really happened, I don't know, I don't know what would happen, but, but I also believe at the end of the day, every town needs a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that will be delivered digitally or physically, but you have to have somebody reporting local news. So I'm not too worried. I think that survives. Um, I just don't know the delivery method. So, and then if that survives, um, we survive. So yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, Stefan, I'd like to, if you could stick around, we'll continue a little bit more on the web. Let's do it. Right, thank you so much. Sure. Stop thank you. Thank you.